And we're talking about now processing the scene and where to begin. Here we have this diagram of a residence with these rooms in it. It's a homicide scene, there's the body. So what we would do is normally, we would start outside. Document the outside. If there's any signs of uh, evidence outside, we would collect that evidence, uh, photograph it, add it to our sketch, take the measurement. And another thing, uh, other than just the four sides, is the general vicinity itself. So this number five is showing the area. So that would be where we could start outside. Then if you have a point of entry, you might go ahead and photograph, let's say that it was the window back here of the dining room. Well, then you could perhaps photograph that window and then start your processing inside, inside that window, if you're pretty sure about the point of entry. Otherwise, you're probably just gonna choose one of the entryways. So here's a front door, here's a back door to begin your process or your photographing and processing of the scene. So uh, let's say we start here at the front door. Then we could process this area, the hallway leading up to the body. Once we have processed this area and we process the area of the body, then we can move on to other areas that are less important. So the living room, the dining room, the family room, and then perhaps upstairs. At a homicide scene, you're gonna to wanna to check out the entire house. Um, and so that's, a, that's kind of a, a way to get started. Further in processing the crime scene, uh, the main points, we're going to prioritize the collection of evidence. So the investigator in charge, and the team members will determine the order in which evidence co is collected. And a very important thing to keep in mind here, I touched on a moment ago, is that we need to consider crime scene reconstruction before we collect evidence. So uh, what will often happen is you'll do your walkthrough, you'll go back in, you'll do your search, we'll talk about the search in a moment, and we'll search out evidence. We will then be placing these tent numbers. You see these all the time on TV and in the movies. We actually do use these, that's accurate. And we'll put our little numbers down around everything. Before we start collecting anything, there's other steps. We have to photograph all of our evidence. We have to measure it and add it to our sketch. Uh, some of it we may have to do samples of some sort. And then we'll be collecting evidence. Well, before we collect evidence, we need to consider crime scene reconstruction. As an example, let's say that we have uh, a, some gunshots were fired in the, in the scene, and there is a bullet hole in uh, an object, the bullet passes through and then goes into a wall. Well, what we're going to want to do is try out bullet trajectory analysis showing the path of the bullet. Well, if this object that the bullet passed through is something we're going to collect as evidence, maybe it's a small figurine, a wood carving, something like that, we would not want to collect the evidence and then go, gee, should we do any reconstruction? Because now we have moved the item that had the bullet hole in it. So before we collect evidence, we should all stop People should get together if there's more than one of you there and say, now what do we think about this so far? Uh, what kind of theories do we have? What does the evidence say to us? I like to, to say that the evidence is talking to us. It's actually probably screaming at us. It's, it's like my grandkids, they're saying, it, the evidence is going, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's what my grandkids do. You know, when they're doing something, they want me to look at them. Uh, and they're showing off. Well, the evidence is doing the same thing. It's saying, look at me. But a lot of times what CSIs will end up doing is going, okay, let's see, I've got to uh, find the evidence. Okay, I found it all. I've got to photograph it. Uh, now I've got to put it on my sketch. Okay, I got that. Uh, I got those, did I get all the measurements? Okay, 
Now, what bags do I put these things in? Do I use plastic or paper? Okay, I and then they collect it all, and they're just focused on the tasks alone, and they just completely miss the opportunity to listen to the evidence, to let the evidence tell it tell them what happened. So before collecting evidence, you stop, you look at it, you talk it over, and if there is any evidence that can help you to do a reconstruction, like the bullet trajectory or blood stain evidence. Some items will have blood stain patterns on them. If you collect them and move them, now you have a problem with the, with the reconstruction. So those things need to stay. So we need to consider that as we prioritize the collection of evidence. Now, the next thing we wanna talk about is um, crime scene search methods. So we need to, when we're doing this process in the scene, we need to find evidence. A lot of evidence is in plain view. It's hard to miss. Uh, if we don't pay attention, we'll just trip right over it. It's right there. There's the body. There's the, the, the gun. Uh, there is whatever else. But often evidence is hard to find. Sometimes it's very small, hard to see. Sometimes it's invisible, such as DNA and body fluids. Uh, so we have to search out for our evidence. And there are several different ways to do that. So the investigator in charge is gonna consider the different search strategies for crime scenes, depending upon the locale and the number of officials available to aid in searching. So there are four types of searches, and those four types are the lane or strip search, the grid search, the zone search, and the spiral search. Now there are some things to consider when choosing a strategy, a search strategy or method. Uh, the size of the area is one. Are we indoors or are we outdoors? that sort of thing. So let's look, let's just jump into it and look at these different strategies. So the first one is the lane or strip search. So here's a little diagram, a uh, couple of them. And basically with a lane or strip search, you just walk along and if you have multiple searchers, you can actually walk parallel to each other and cover a large area. So let's say you're outdoors, you have a large area, you can get several searchers side by side and just walk through the area searching as you go. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind if you're gonna do this outdoors. You wanna make sure if you have more than one person and you're doing it like this, that they're not too far apart. Uh, they need to be close enough to be able to see a uh, little bit of overlapping area. So that if one person might miss something right here in between, the other one will pick it up. Uh, and a lot of that depends on the terrain. Also, as you're going along in a row, let's say there's four people in a row, you're using police cadets or something like that. Uh, if somebody finds something, the whole row, the whole line stops. Everybody stops, they stay where they are and they don't move any further. You want everybody to stay together. That way it, you ensure that you're gonna cover the whole area. If the line starts go, becoming uneven, it can actually go, you know, stop being straight and you'll have gaps, so everybody stops. All right, you can also use this kind of a search method indoors. So here we have uh, a lane thing that you could do indoors all by yourself. You could even do this indoors with more than one person, probably not, but that, that would be the lane or strip search. Where I see it used most is outdoors. All right, so that's, that's one way of searching. A second way is to use the grid search. Now grid search is a bit like a lane search but you change direction and double back. You go across and back and across and back, and then you do it the other direction like so. That way, 
you're covering every area twice. And that helps you to be a little more thorough. It takes twice as long, but it gives you a much more thorough search of the area. And then the third search technique is the one I prefer, especially indoors, and that is the zone search. Now with a zone search, basically all you do is you divide the area to be searched into smaller areas or zones. And then each one of these zones is searched one at a time very thoroughly. If this was a room here, I would probably make the zone even smaller than what you see on the screen. I take a small area and then I search it very carefully. I use my flashlight. By the way, on television, the way they use a flashlight is they put the flashlight alongside their head and they walk around in the dark looking for evidence. That's what they do on TV. That's why I don't watch those CSI programs because I got tired of screaming at my television, turn on the lights, because they never turned the lights on. It was always dark in their crime scenes. Well, you know what? Once you have done your walkthrough and you've recorded the which lights are on and which are off, turn on the lights. It's gonna be a lot easier to find evidence and to process your scene when you have light. But still, even if there's a lot of light, I'm going to use my flashlight because what I'll do is use my light at a low oblique angle on the floors, on furniture. Often there'll be things that blend in with the floor. I'll have my little flashlight and you can get really powerful ones, that's what you want, and use an oblique angle and then see your evidence more clearly. Also, what that flashlight allows you to do is focus your attention into a smaller area. If you just walk in and kind of look around, I don't see anything here, you'll never find anything, except the big stuff that you're going to trip over anyway. Finding small items, you need to be very focused and look at small areas at a time. By using a flashlight, I can paint the whole area slowly, looking carefully, making sure I don't miss any area. And in those small areas, use my light at an oblique angle, causing shadows. I'll look, um, now this is, by the way, after we've taken our overview photographs, so now we can move things. This is the search part. Uh, I've already done that, so now I can move things in my search. So I can look underneath furniture, I can lift cushions and look under cushions, look behind pillows. I can look in lampshades. I can look at the ceiling, the walls. Don't forget to look at the ceiling. Um, in drawers, whatever I need to do, and I'm very thorough. So once I have finished uh, covering one of these zones, then I can move to the next zone. And what is helpful is, if there is more than one of you there, is somebody else follows you and does your zone, your first zone once you're done. And let them see if they find anything. Now, as you find things, again, you're probably gonna use your markers. So that is the zone search. And uh, that's, the, that's the search for indoors that I probably used 99% of the time. Zone search is also very helpful in something like uh, a vehicle. So you can just say that the driver's uh, seat, front seat area, driver's side or left side, if you're, if it's not a uh, you know, right-hand drive car, uh, the driver's side uh, front seat area would be zone one. The back seat area on the driver's side or left side would be zone two. Zone three, passenger side, front, zone four, back seat, and then zone five, the trunk, and zone six, the engine compartment. So very simple setting up those zones, searching them one at a time. If instead what you did was just lean in and look at the whole front area, you'd probably miss things. So we take our time and we do it by zone. Then the fourth 
uh, way of searching is the spiral search. So with a spiral search, uh, you can do it one of two ways. You can start in the middle of your scene and work your way outward, or you could actually start outside the scene and work your way inward, though that seems to be much more difficult to kind of keep track of where you are. Now, where would you use this? Well, I definitely would not use this indoors, um, unless we're talking about an indoor stadium and it's the playing field, something like that. Maybe that might be a time to do the spiral search. But typically, what we find is we use that outdoors and for a scene such as a bombing scene. So you have an explosion, you'll have a crater, you'll have the, the initial point of explosion, and you can start there and then just start searching by walking in a spiral fashion, going outward, looking for evidence. And then you just keep going until you run out of evidence and then go some more. And then when you're satisfied, you've covered the area, you stop. So that's a spiral search. Uh, now, a couple things to keep in mind there is number one, when you're walking to the center, you may be walking over evidence. So you have to be very careful, uh, walk carefully, and uh, you know, see where you're stepping. Uh, and second is there's a tendency when some people do this, when they get further out, the spacing gets larger. But keep it nice and tight, again, tight enough so that you can see everything as you go by each time in that area that you're supposed to see, that there's no gaps, you're not too far away. Now, as far as an outdoor search, there's those little wire uh, devices that have a flag on them. And you just go ahead as you find evidence as you are doing this spiral search, and you just stick one of those uh, little flags in the ground right where your evidence is, and then keep going. And then it's easy to come back, uh, measure where your evidence is, photograph it, collect it. So that's the spiral search. So we have the lane or strip search, the grid search, the zone search, and the spiral search. As I said, zone is usually going to be what you use indoors. Spiral search would be the least likely to use indoors. You can do the lane or strip search and the grid search indoors, and you'll just look at the scene and decide what is uh, most appropriate for what you have. Next point on processing the crime scene, we're going to collect, preserve, inventory, package, transport, and submit evidence. So the team members, that's all of you, are going to ensure that we collect the evidence collect, uh, correctly, we preserve it properly, we package it uh, in the right materials, and then we transport it to be booked into evidence. And the handling of physical evidence is one of the most important factors of the investigation. We need to handle it properly so that we maintain the integrity of the evidence, we do not contaminate it, and then it will be effective for our um, our, our case. I want to show you a video. In that shooting where four people shot near Georgia State University near JR Crickets, Jennifer Bellamy on the scene, our crew found a gun in the street. Our crew, not police, not investigators, but we did. Jen, Jennifer, explain to us exactly, walk us through how you guys on the scene were able to find this gun. Well, Vinny, this happened about 25 minutes ago, and if you look right here, the gun is still here in the middle of the street. What happened is one of uh, uh, the vehicles that was parked along the street moved to get their state, their day started, and after that car moved out of this parking space, my photographer, Jojo Johnson, noticed this gun and said, whoa, what is this out here? Uh, police have arrived on the scene. They're checking out, but the gun is still where it was found, right here in the middle of the street. Now, this is all after a quadruple shooting that happened here last night on Forsyth Street. We're told that this may have all started as an attempted robbery. Right now, police still sorting out information, and clearly there's more investigating to be done with this gun found out here. Where it's Benny? Yeah, uh, uh, Jennifer, so police were already gone. Police had left the scene. The investigation was over when you found the gun. 
Well, the investigation ongoing, but the scene had been cleared, Benny, and we spoke with police overnight, and they told us that there were two guns recovered, but clearly there is a third out here that we just found that is most likely connected to what was going on. This is just in the street, a few feet away from the buildings that had their windows shot out as a part of this situation that happened last night. All right, Jen, if you can, if you can Jennifer, if you could for us, show us where the shooting was and then where the gun was found. How close in, in proximity here? It's, it's right there. Can you kind of show That's us right. with the camera? Jojo, can we turn around and show? This is the JR Crickets where uh, we're told that the shooting happened just around. You can see the boarded up windows. There were shattered glass out here. And just a few feet away, if you turn, walk with me, and you'll see right here in this parking lot just adjacent to the building is where we found that gun. So just a matter of feet. Imagine if you were the chief of police or the CSI supervisor and you see that first thing in the morning, you're going to be wondering, what's with my CSIs? And you noticed how close to the shooting this gun was. It was, you know, just a few feet away from the holes in the windows. Now, obviously, what they're saying is the gun was underneath a parked car. But that just shows us that we have to search carefully. Not only was the gun uh, under a parked car, but over here you can see there's a cartridge case. And the information that I was able to get said that there were two additional shell casings, is what it, they're cartridge cases. But here's a picture of one of them. And even the gun has blood stain on it, and it was missed. Um, not acceptable not acceptable. Uh, can we miss things at a crime scene? Well, of course, it's going to happen. A lot of evidence is small. Uh, there's environmental factors, lighting, but something like a gun, you had a shooting. Uh, wouldn't you be looking for cartridge cases as well at a shooting scene? Count how many bullet holes there are, find out from witnesses how many shots were fired, see how many cartridge cases you have found, and then Maybe there should be some more and search until you have looked everywhere. Uh, so that's kind of a, uh, that's a big one. All right. So I, I certainly would not want to be the CSIs that miss that. And a lot of times you have to look in the oddest places for things. Often you have to take things apart to be able to get to where you want to look at something. So we have to be very thorough. Another point in the processing of a crime scene, uh, detailed evidence collection. Uh, this is where uh, we're going to collect any and all potential evidence. So that's one of the steps that we take. Again, we talked about doing this after we have discussed whether we need to do crime scene reconstruction. And if we do, we leave that evidence alone until the reconstruction is finished. Speaking of crime scene reconstruction, here we have a little information about that. What is crime scene reconstruction? The use of scientific methods, physical evidence, deductive reasoning, and their interrelationships to gain explicit knowledge of the series of events that surround the commission of a crime. So this is a very deliberate act uh, or process. We're going to look at our evidence. Uh, we're going to do some calculations perhaps as with blood stain pattern interpretation, where we're even going to measure blood stain and get angles from that. Uh, we're going to use our deductive reasoning and how the evidence all interrelates in order to come up with conclusions. Now, this is very important because a lot of what we do is prove or disprove witnesses and suspects and even victims' statements. And so being able to prove out how things happen is very important. Uh, blood stain pattern analysis is a good example. You can identify uh, where people were, uh, their identity, whose blood was it, the number of blows that were, uh, were given. Firearms is another really good example. We can learn about trajectory, which is the path of the bullet. You know, that could be very important to our case shooting distance, uh, gunshot residue, and so forth. Crime scene reconstruction is something that we do uh, we, at many scenes, not all, but when you have an opportunity, hopefully you're not gonna miss it.